Hi guys, this is gsnlon.com and I'm here with the Huawei Honor 4X and this is a mid-range phablet and it's one of the many Huawei devices we have tested this year. We already tested the Huawei P8, P8 Lite, the Huawei Mate S, Honor 6 and Honor 6 Plus and now it's time for the Honor 4X. I consider it to be sort of an HTC Desire 820 rival, also a bit of a cheaper Asus Zenfone 2 rival if you want to and this one was launched in the fall of 2014 and last time I checked its price tag is $154 at least on the Indian market. All of the Huawei phones I mentioned before have great cameras and let's see if this one can continue their tradition. First things first, the design. This phone measures 8.65 mm in thickness, it weighs 170 grams, so a bit heavy. It's the same weight as the Asus Zenfone 2 and Zenfone 2 Laser. Um, it's also a bit uh, thinner than the uh, Laser model. The Asus Zenfone 2 Laser measures 10.8 mm, this one only 8.65 mm. Meanwhile, the HTC Desire 820 is thinner than this model at 7.7 mm and it's also lighter by 15 grams. All of the phones I just mentioned are 5.5 inch phablets such as this one. We're dealing here with a plastic case and the back feels um, pretty fragile if you ask me and the texture is pretty interesting. It's a bit like the texture of a twig basket if you know what I'm talking about and it sounds a bit hollow when tapped. The phone is quite comfy to hold and it's a bit hard to use with a single hand because it's quite a long phablet. It may be a long phablet but it's also 5mm shorter than the HTC Desire 820. The build is uh, I would say relatively solid, doesn't feel very solid, there is no strong metal frame to reassure us. Ok, the front side is a bit of a fingerprint magnet and it already has a protection for the screen attached. Now at the front we got big screen bezels. We have the earpiece here, the sensors and the notification LED here, the front camera and these three capacitive buttons that will not always respond very well to your press, sadly. At the back, main camera and LED flash in this metal looking mechanism and then the cover is very easy to remove, I have to say, quite easy, feels a bit flimsy actually because it's very light and slim no removable battery, micro SD card slot and the two micro SIM slots and that's about it. And here you should also be able to see the speaker very discreetly placed here. Now at the top we got the audio jack and microphone while at the bottom there's the speaker, another microphone and excuse me, there's the speaker, another microphone and the micro USB port. It's interesting we have two microphones so noise cancelling is promised. Nothing on the left side. Well, on the right, there's the power button and volume buttons that both offer good feedback when pressing them. The handset offers a compromise in material quality, however, it's comfy and it's not very bad looking, so we find it to be a pretty okay phablet, especially for $154. Now, as far as the specs are concerned, this model provides a 5.5 inch screen, an IPS LCD, with a resolution of 720p, which is 1280 over 720 pixels. The processor inside this handset, well, this one is a high silicon Kirin 620, an octa-core unit clocked at 1.2 GHz. We're also getting the Mali 450 MP GPU, and by the way, there's also a secondary version of the Huawei Honor 4X that provides you with a Snapdragon 410 processor, we don't have that, we have the Kirin 620 version. Anyway, other specs include 2GB of RAM, only 8GB of storage, of which you get 3.65GB free, which is a thing I don't quite like, as you can see here. From 8, you only get 3 and 65. And uh, of course, you can use a microSD card, but that's beside the point. The microSD card supports up to 32GB extra. The specs list goes on with a 5 megapixel shooter for the selfies, a 30 megapixel back shooter as the main camera with an LED flash, and on the connectivity side there is Bluetooth 4.0, GPS, GLONASS, Wi-Fi BGN, micro USB 2.0, and LTE on both SIMs. There is no NFC here in case you're wondering, and the sensors include the accelerometer, gyroscope, proximity sensor, and brightness sensor. 
the battery of this handset well this one is a 3000 mAh unit it's a lithium polymer one is the same capacity as the asus zenfone 2 and it beats the htc desire 120's 2600 mAh unit now uh, we tested this battery as usual with a hd video playback test in a loop with wi-fi on brightness of 200 lux and we achieved 8 hours and 6 minutes of video playback which is okay for the price we beat the asus zenfone 2 ZE551 ML that scores 7 hours and 30 minutes, the HTC Desire 816 with its 7 hours and 44 minutes, and the HTC Desire 820 that only scored 7 hours and 13 minutes of playback. Of course, we also scored below some handsets out there, like the Huawei Honor 6, 8 hours and 58 minutes, the Asus Zenfone 2 Laser with a huge 11 hours and 11 minutes, and the HTC One M8 with 10 hours and 15 minutes. We also did a PC mark test that came out very impressive. This is continuous usage simulation, 7 hours and 30 minutes, very very good for a handset so cheap. We even beat the Samsung Galaxy S6 that scored 7 hours and 6 minutes in this test, Galaxy S6 Edge, 6 hours and 41 minutes, and um, the Huawei Mate S, 6 hours and 26 minutes. We scored below the Asus Zenfone 2 Laser with its 8 hours and 16 minutes, Galaxy Note 5, 8 hours and 6 minutes, and the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus, 7 hours and 52 minutes, but those are champions, so it's very nice to compare this mid-range phone with champions. The charging is also reasonable at 2 hours and 35 minutes. We beat the Huawei P8 Lite that requires 2 hours and 41 minutes to charge or the Amazon Fire Phone that charges in 2 hours and 43 minutes. Meanwhile, the Asus Zenfone 2 Laser charges in 3 hours and 24 minutes. Of course, there are phones that charge must fa much faster than this one, like the HTC One M9, 2 hours and 20 minutes, the Lumia 930, 2 hours and 15 minutes, or the Galaxy S6, 1 hour and 10 minutes. Obviously, we have some special settings in the power area, in the settings area. We got power monitoring that scans your device, finds issues and makes recommendations on how to save more juice. Then there are the actual power saving settings like Ultra, which triggers a black and white interface and only the basic features with as little connectivity as possible. So you only get to phone call and do some messaging and that's it. Next up, there's the smart mode that automatically adjusts the CPU and network usage for a balanced performance and then there's the normal mode that makes only slight adjustments to maximize performance and is recommended for gaming and online videos. We got power info here to see the consumption level, level on various apps. The menu is here with an ultra power saving reminder and that's about it as far as the battery is concerned. Very good battery, especially for a mid-ranger. Now I'm going to move on to the acoustics. First things first, this phone does not come bundled with headphones and the speaker is placed right here at the bottom. Now as far as the music player is concerned, it looks like a typical Emotion UI player, feels a bit like the iOS player. It has a minimalistic user interface, as you can see, white background and black text. Got filter settings here and a timer. There is no trace of an equalizer here. Okay, now let's actually listen to some tunes and draw some conclusions. Ok, it's conclusion time, the sound is quite loud and clear, the bass is ok, there's a bit of distortion at the maximum volume and even if you cover the speaker while playing a game or watching a video, you can still hear the basic sound, so there's no muffling here, here we go. So imagine I'm playing a game or watching a video, it's a bit muffled but you get the basic idea of the sound instead of totally covering it like it happens with other phones. Ok, this handset also provides you with uh, FM radio in this area here, FM radio, of course don't have headphones so you cannot test that, 
and uh, we have a decibel meter test here as usual. This is the decibel meter showing us a value of 83.9 decibels, which is good. It means we beat the iPhone 6 Plus with its 83.8 decibels or the LG G Flex 2 with its 82.9 decibels as well as the Huawei P8 Lite and its 82.9 decibels as well. Still, we scored below the iPhone 6 with its 85.2 decibels or the OnePlus One with its 90.5 decibels. Earlier, you saw me pressing that DTS button, basically the DTS mode what it does is that it amps the sound a bit, gives it a bit more bass and a bit more punch, basically makes it louder. Here we got features related to sound, only the DTS mode interests us, the other ones are not very interesting. So overall good acoustics, nothing to uh, be mad about here except maybe for the lack of headphones and slight distortion max volume. Now it's time to talk about the display. What you're seeing here is a 5.5 inch IPS LCD screen with a resolution of 1280 over 720 pixels. It's a bit of a fingerprint magnet, which may be the cause of this layer of protection on top of it. It's a fully laminated screen and the video app we're using here is very minimalistic and simple and even includes a DTS option. The usual test sample, the DTS option here and now let's quietly analyze it. The image is bright, quite crisp for a 720p screen, color saturation is quite ok, we got wide viewing angles, contrast is reasonably good, it even behaves decently in full sunlight. Of course, it's October, there's not exactly much sunlight to speak of. Pixels are of the RGB stripe kind, and let's see what that means. These are the pixels of the screen under the microscope, RGB stripe. We use the lux meter to measure the brightness and what we achieved is 430 lux, which is quite good. We beat the HTC Desire 820 with its 396 lux and also the OnePlus One with its 404 lux plus the LG G Flex 2 and its 266 lux units. We scored below the Huawei Mate S 455 lux and below the HTC One M8 463 lux. Meanwhile, the AllView X2 Soul Pro also beat us with 471 lux. Obviously, there are special settings for the display, including color temperature with this slider here to make the image cooler or warmer. It's best to leave it default, in my opinion. Wallpaper, font size can be set up, font style as well. Daydream indicator light, brightness, sleep, and you can even increase readability under sunlight. So yes, the contrast is good. This is a very good screen for the price. Nothing to object here, truly, and uh, now we go further to the camera combo. 5 megapixel at the front, 30 megapixel at the back. From what I understood, it has a Sony sensor, f2.0 aperture, wide angle lens, and uh, I have to say that the app, the camera app, opens up reasonably fast. Actually, faster than anyone expects for a $150 phone. This is our usual castle, and this is our usual interface that we see on Huawei phones this year and the past year, minimalistic, feeling a bit like iOS, lots of white, lots of white text and lots of basic features. Ok, so first things first, let's see the main capture modes, you have to stick with the portrait orientation, we got panorama, HDR, audio note, best photo, all focus and watermark, all of them speaks for themselves, best photo allows to select a photo out of a series of shots, all focus is basically refocusing and watermark lets you add some funky text over your shot. A resolution can be 13 megapixels in 4 to 3 or 10 megapixels in 16 to 9. You can choose GPS tag, preferred save location, mute, audio control can be set to on or off, timer, touch to capture, capture smiles, object tracking, touch and hold shutter button for burst or focus, volume button function and something called ultra snapshot so you can double press the volume down key when the phone is locked in order to open the camera and take a shot. So here we go, phone is locked, double press volume button and guess what, we already took a shot very fast, you can see it right here, the speed is quite impressive I have to say. Ok, going back to those options, we're not finished and uh, we got here ISO going up to 1600, white balance with a few options of its own this portrait orientation is killing me and image adjustment with saturation, contrast and brightness all available 
here okay uh, then we have the front camera shortcut button and the flash options there's the torch flash on flash automatic and flash off among these options on the right side we have the effects quite a few of them nostalgia childhood mono and all that the beauty slider you can go from 0 to 10 and really smooth on the wrinkles on your face if you have them and then there's the video area with its own options like resolution can be 1080p in stereo audio can be 720p or lower gps tag beauty mode and object tracking are here as well okay now if we turn to the front camera and uh, you're going to see some extra options we got panorama for the front camera as well audio note watermark mirror reflection resolution 5 megapixels or 3.8 megapixels mute audio control touch to capture iso white balance and saturation contrast and brightness are included here as well there is a beauty slider yet again and this option to enhance the brightness of the screen so you can take better selfies okay then in the video area you'll find out that you can take 720p videos using your front camera enough playing around now let's get back to the main camera and analyze its experience okay so what we're dealing with is a fast focus as you can well see for yourself a fluid zoom experience even if it's touch zoom and then we got this exposure slider here once the frame is focused you can play with the exposure slider for the proper exposure if you keep the screen pressed you can drag the two frames to adjust the focus and metering point and finally picture taking is almost as fast as the uh, camera app opening which was it turned very fast let's take a shot and actually view that picture fast taken and quite clear i have to say you can really tell the text here and if you start zooming in the quality remains quite good for this castle right here okay enough with the castle it's time to go to the hardcore stuff which means the real test of the camera in a very cloudy october mid-october actually over 100 photos some of them have color some of them don't and it started off as a semi sunny day and i have to say that this year i've tested five huawei models all of them with good cameras first things first i receive an iphone 6s for testing and i use the huawei honor 4x to take a photo of its unboxing and as you can see the photos look really nice keep in mind they had the flash on the flash of this phone on indoor with very poor lighting and still the pictures are crisp details are good and you can really see the texture of this iphone 6s a lot of shots here in various conditions of lower light and the huawei phone handled them pretty well okay then we move to the outdoor quite a bit of them and we noticed something the colors were quite cold it was a cloudy day but still the colors felt a bit cold we got a landscape shot here with uh, okay details which is a bit of a surprise I noticed that when zooming in details were okay once again cold colors keep that in mind and uh, most of the shots we took were clear I cannot remember one blurry shot which is a compliment for this mid-range affordable phone focus was good as was the white balance and exposure the colors as I said before look nice if you ignore the fact that they're quite cold we got a white panorama here taken without artifacts and with very nice details and without curving the image too much the resolution is 17,728 pixels over 2944 pixels and the details are simply great as you can see I like the texture of this brick building it really caught the essence of the brick so to say and then there are the usual flower pictures we played with the focus we played with the details and the result is quite impressive I have to say this is the all focus feature you can touch anywhere to refocus on the flowers in the background on the flowers in the foreground and then you can save your refocusing okay one more here focus on the flower here or the one here blur this flower in the foreground as you can see the background is now blurred and now the foreground is blurred so that's what the old focus feature is all about then we go even further good details excellent texture here and this white is very very pure once again it's mid-october it's very cloudy so high praise to the brightness and exposure of this camera 
more shots and even a selfie was taken. I have to say it looks decent, it's a 5 megapixel camera after all on a $150 phone with a lot of skin texture smoothing and considering that I would have to say it's quite good. It's no Huawei P8 selfie, that was very good but it's reasonable. Even more shots of flowers and colorful stuff. Excellent yet again, when I say excellent I mean details and even some of the blues here look good. You can really see the inscription and texture of these rocks. And this is a test of the HDR, it's very subtle, it doesn't change the exposure in a huge way, once again pretty subtle. Ok, playing again with the colors and saturations, a very nice close up of this monument here. Some overexposure in some times, but once again not one blurry shot in these hundreds of pictures in the gallery. Zoom in as you like, you can see there is no problem here, no loss of focus and anything like that. I'm pretty impressed by this 30 megapixel camera on a $150 phone and the shots keep coming in. These are taken sort of indoors, it's a bit of an inn that's covered with a roof and the brightness is quite good. These are the gourmet shots, as Sony would call them, they have a special gourmet mode on the camera. You can really see the texture of the soup. And then we got indoors, well because of the poor lighting, you can see that the shots are slightly grainy, but the ice cream is pretty clearly shown here, and you can even play with the refocus thing, focus on the biscuit or on the ice cream. So overall it's a great camera for the price tag. I would even go as far as to put it on par, with the Huawei Honor 6 and Huawei P8 Lite level and uh, I have to say that it's much better in landscape shots than my own iPhone 5 for example and it's also better in landscape shots than the praised Asus Zenfone 2 Laser but it's below that phone when it comes to close-ups. I should also mention that this camera as far as the pictures are concerned is clearly above the HTC Desire 820. Now let's go to the video area and we have three videos shot with this camera, they're mp4 files, 29 frames per second videos, they have a huge bitrate which impressed me, 23 mega per second. In spite of that, they're not hugely impressive as you'll see for yourself. So this is video number one. A bit shaky and some detail loss when zooming in. Plus. The exposure change was a bit sudden and not very good. As you'll see on YouTube, the quality of the image drops quite a bit when you zoom in and the colors and clarity generally were good here. Now uh, another video, the second one is uh, this one here. This one is slightly shaky as well. The colors look good and the clarity is also quite good. The sound is a bit echoey. And once again when we start to zoom in, we register some quality loss. Okay, and then the third video is this one here, a bit more in the shade and a bit more color than the previous ones. Nice texture of these monuments. A bit less shaky than the other ones, nice colors, nice details and at the end there is a sudden exposure change which I noticed that the camera tends to do in the other videos as well. Overall I would say that the filming is ok but not on par with the picture taking, still it's good for a phone. To editing, you pick a picture, press edit and you got to rotate, filter, adjust and crop and adjust bring several other options like brightness, contrast, saturation, hue, shadows and other things. We are totally done with the camera, keep in mind it's a very good camera for a $150 phone and can even compare to some better priced mid-rangers out there. Now if you want to talk about the temperature, 
We can do that because we have a thermometer shot here. So we played the game Riptide GP2 for 15 minutes and got as high as 41.5 degrees Celsius, which may mean hot, but actually it's not. There's no danger of overheating here, luckily. Now, if you want to see the web browser, this is it, and uh, we're going to load gsmdom.com. I would have to say that the speed is quite good here, so the browser is pretty fast, minimalistic user interface, the keyboard is a bit odd spaced, it feels like the spaces between the keys is a bit too big, luckily we have swipe helping us, and also a bunch of settings related to this method, that settings here, with auto correction, auto capitalization, themes, my words, languages and gestures, all of that included in this area here. So, good keyboard, but oddly spaced and the browser that's quite fast. Now, if you want to talk about connectivity, there is no NFC, LTE on both SIMs, that's available here. There is no Wi-Fi A or Wi-Fi AC, GPS can find you pretty fast and the LTE is category 4, which means 150 mega per second downloads. Um, there's no dual band Wi-Fi in case you're wondering, but the Wi-Fi signal is quite okay and the features of this uh, phone area include speed dial, privacy protection, harassment filter and a few more like a pocket mode and reject call with text. The cellular signal was good, voice quality was also good, but there was a bit of, let's say, static on the other side of the call. And now let's talk about the benchmarks for this device. I decided to compare the Huawei Honor 4X with the HTC Desire 816, the Huawei P8 Lite and the All X2 Soul. So the comparison here is actually between the Kirin 620 octa-core processor plus 2GB of RAM versus the Snapdragon 400 plus 1.5GB of RAM, the Kirin 620 again from the P8 Lite with 2GB of RAM and finally the MediaTek MT6592 plus 2GB of RAM from the Allview phone I've just mentioned. So time for the benchmarks, here we go, in Quadrant we have an underwhelming score of 5764 points, we got beaten by the HTC Desire 16 with its 12736 points and uh, we got beaten by the Huawei P8 Lite with its 9400 points. In the meantime the All X2 Soul scores 14654 points. In Antutu the score was 27251 which is uh, 6,000 uh, bigger than the HTC Desire 816 and also it's lower than the Huawei P8 Lite, 35,596 points. It's very close to the All X2 Souls, 27,630 points though. In Nanomark, the score was 59.3 frames per second, which is higher than the HTC Desire 816 with its 58.1 frames per second and lower than the 60.2 frames per second of the Huawei P8 Lite. In the meantime, we beat the All X2 Soul that had 57.2 frames. The Velamo score that we registered is 1841 in Chrome, which beats the HTC phone by 400 points. It's less than the P8 Lite by about 100 points, and it beats uh, excuse me, it gets beaten by the All X2 Soul by quite a bit, that one has 26-24 points. 3D Mark brought us a result that feels quite low. In the iStorm Unlimited test, 53.85, the HTC phone 48.32, the P8 Lite from Huawei, 56.56, and the All X2 Soul, 71.38. Next up is Geekbench 3. 556 in the single core test, 1723 in the multi core one. The Desire 116 had 436 over uh, 1416. The Huawei P8 Lite registered 591 over 2600. And finally, the All X2 Soul 445 over 2464. We also have GFX Bench somewhere in here with a result that will test the GPU of this handset, so let's look it up. Should be in here somewhere. Lots of benchmarks and here we go, finally. It's 9.1 frames per second on the Huawei Honor 4X, while the HTC phone has 5.8, the P8 Lite 5.6, and finally the All X2 Soul 8.7 frames per second. We also did a speed test on Wi-Fi, 
and we got 21 mega per second in download and 21 in upload while the HTC Desire phone had 21 and 22, the Huawei P8 Lite 19 and 20 and the OVU X2 Soul 12 and 19. And then there's browser mark the score of 1187 which is bigger than the HTC Desire phone's 625, also bigger than the Huawei P8 Lite's 1045 and it beats the All UX2 Souls 818 points. However, in Sun Spider, where the lower score is the better, we had 1739, we got beaten by all the other phones with 1542 on the HTC phone, 1618 on the P8 Lite and 1074 on the All View phone. And the last benchmark is Basemark X. 10,556, we beat the HTC Desire 816 by about 3,000 points, got beaten by the P8 Lite by about, um, let's say, uh, 1,000 points and a bit. So, that's about it. Overall, the benchmarks are a bit underwhelming, especially considering that the Huawei P8 Lite has pretty much the same specs as this model and still manages to beat it. Without the old new phone into account, we win only 3 out of 11 benchmarks. With the old new phone into account, only 2 out of 11, so we don't win many benchmarks with this setup right here, which is kind of strange, especially the quadrant score feels a bit strange. In spite of that, we registered no trace of lag, even when running PES, Club Manager in the background and having quite a few apps updated, no lag whatsoever and no problem with the functioning. We also played games without a problem, like Riptide GP2 with its 3D graphics set to the max, and all the cool reflections and speed and water that you may want. Still waiting for Riptide GP3 to appear somewhere in the future, in the meantime, this remains our benchmark game. Responds quite well to the commands, very nice sun reflection, nice looking water and the speed sensation is quite good. You can see the water drops on the screen. And that was the gaming experience in a nutshell. Keep in mind, in spite of the lower benchmarks, we get a pretty good performance and no lag. Now, as far as the OS is concerned, We're dealing here with Android 4.4.2, which is KitKat, with Emotion UI 3.0 on top. It's a pity we don't have Lollipop yet, let alone Marshmallow. This is a typical Emotion UI interface that's flat and minimalistic. There is no app drawer, all of the apps are placed on the home screens, and it feels inspired by iOS sometimes through this flat interface. If you keep the screen pressed, the home screen, you can tweak the wallpapers, you can also view the widgets divided into categories, some of them looking quite hot for email, voice control, power control, notepad optimization and all that. Then there are transitions like default perspective, windmill, squeeze, box, rotate and home settings like the home layout, 4 on 5 or 4 on 4, home screen loop or auto align. So that's what you can change from here. Multitasking is done by pressing the recent button and flicking up to close apps. They're shown as four thumbnails on the screen, reminding me of the HTC Sense interface. The drop-down area features notifications shown as a timeline and quick settings shown as a very minimal gray, blue and white setup. We get here the Do Not Disturb feature, GPS, airplane mode, one-hand UI and all sorts of connectivity related options plus the brightness slider. In the settings area, we got a very minimalistic interface, it's black and white with a white background. For example, we have home screen style here, we can set it to simple for the elderly for example. Uh, power saving, location services, do not disturb, is also available with allowed contacts. Notification manager, protected apps, security. Then we got manage apps, network apps and something called motion control which allows you to flip to mute, shake to rearrange, or double touch the screen to turn it on, plus the usual drawing features to trigger an application. You draw the letter C on the lock screen and trigger the camera. You already know that from other devices. Okay, then there is the one hand UI, which lets you use a smaller part of the screen with one hand as if it were a smaller diagonal. Then there's the annoying suspend button, 
that floats on the screen and replaces the capacitive buttons with virtual ones, smart cover and touch disable mode that will prevent pressing the screen by mistaking your purse, bag or things like that. Ok, enough with the interface, OS and uh, similar items. Let's talk about the apps. So all of the apps are on the home screens. We have over 50 apps here and there's a bit of bloatware to take into account. So we start with Play Store, then there's Teams that supports customization to a pretty high level like lock screen, transition, wallpaper, home wallpaper, app icon style, phone style and more. Then we got gallery, camera, then of course the phone calling and contacts apps and the Google Suite, Chrome, Gmail, Google Plus, Maps, Play Music, Play Books, Play Newsstand and Play Games. Drive, YouTube, Photos, Hangouts, Google Settings and if you want to check out Maps, here it is. It manages to find us pretty fast and you can see public transportation if need be and the traffic also if you feel the need for that. Ok, and now let's see the other applications. We're done with the Google folder, we got messages, we got phone manager that lets you use a phone accelerator, harassment filter, power saving, traffic manager, notification manager and app lock, browser, music, videos, clock, calendar, settings, files, email, high care, voice search, google and then the tools, weather, mirror, magnifier, torch, calculator, notepad, recorder, fm radio, backup, emotion ui updater, downloads, app installer and screen lock and a few social networking apps like twitter, facebook, plus productivity, WPS office and something called highlights. And then 5 games or 5 shortcuts to games and that's the full app list so there's a bit of bloater here but I've seen much more on the latest Asus phones for example. In spite of the bloater and the older Android which is KitKat non Lollipop, we don't register any lag here which is good news and if you go into the lock screen, if you swipe up you can see options related to playback, share, save settings record, calculator, torch and camera, quick shortcuts for you to use. If you are on one of the home screens and you drag to the bottom, you can see a feature similar to the spotlight in iOS, allowing you to search for apps, contacts and messages and see the recently used applications. Ok, so it's time for the verdict here. What we're dealing with is the Huawei Honor 4X, an affordable handset with a phablet approach. So on the pro side we got the affordable pricing, the good battery, good acoustics and the good display plus an excellent camera for what you're paying and a pretty ok selfie shooter, there's no lag here and this one is a comfy phone so those are all the pros. The three main multimedia aspects, acoustics, display and camera all check out so they're good. On the con side the case remains a bit fragile and a bit uh, plastic cheap feeling you know what I'm talking about, there's no NFC, there's no Wi-Fi A or Wi-Fi AC, little storage, only 3.6 gigabytes out of 8 gigabytes. Um, I have to say that uh, the videos that are filmed with the camera are a bit shaky and have bad exposure. And finally, the benchmarks are lower than the ones of the Huawei P8 Lite in spite of having the same specs. And then there's the bloatware. Ok, so we're not going to give grades anymore, we're just giving verdicts for handsets now. So the Huawei Honor 4X is an affordable mid-range phone. It can be considered a bigger Huawei P8 Lite since it shares the same specs. And it has an older OS right now, but with an update it should be more appealing if it comes soon. The camera, battery and acoustics are good enough to worth the purchase, once again it's only a bit uh, above $150 or so, so that's very very appealing. Young people want a good camera and good battery and this is exactly what this phone offers, so it's great for young people who travel and like to take pictures. And also it has a good screen and acoustics. So that's the Huawei Honor 4X in a nutshell, a very good affordable mid-range tablet with a above the average camera. This is it from gsn.com, bye bye.